uh, intently as we go to the Word of God. The title of the message this morning, and this seems like quite an opposite subject from how we just celebrated our country and celebrated uh, the veterans who fought for our country. And, and as I say the title of this message, I don't want this title to depress you because actually the title of this message is a good sign of things to come. Now you'll need to bear with me to the end of the message to know what I'm talking about. The title of the message is this, The Coming One World Government. The Coming One World Government. Again, as I say, if that title discourages you, then I want to help you dig into the Word of God a little bit more to understand that there's a good end to this. Uh, we're going somewhere. And I want us to see that. You know, this election cycle, there were many people I voted for that thankfully were re-elected to office. There were some I voted for who uh, were not re-elected to office. But I'm reminded, and, I, and over and over in this election uh, time, the Lord kept impressing my heart with these words, Matthew chapter 6, verses, verse 10 especially, were to pray... Jesus said, verse 9, After this manner, therefore pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then look at verse 10. Would you read it with me out loud? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Those words just kept permeating my mind and my heart these last few weeks. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. There is a coming one world government. Go to Daniel chapter 2, please. Daniel chapter 2. God's Word has prophesied these things long before they show up in our newspapers, long before they show up in our internet feeds. And uh, should not take us by surprise. If we know what God's Word says, we don't need to be afraid. If we know what God's Word says, we don't need to worry. We actually need to rejoice. Uh, we need to get excited because we see Scripture coming to pass in front of us. And again, if you're here and you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, then I can understand why you'd be concerned. I can, I can understand the trouble in your heart, but you don't have to leave here with that trouble in your heart. You can be saved today. You can know you're a child of God. In Daniel chapter 2... Verses 1 through 19, we're not going to read that entire passage, but I'm going to summarize it for you, and I hope maybe you'll go back and read it later. Uh, king Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. He's basically in charge of the world at the time. He's the king of the world. He's running and ruling other nations. He's, he, his empire is massive. It's the Babylonian Empire. Babylon, by the way, is modern-day Iraq. And uh, he ruled and reigned and was powerful and prideful and and filled with himself, filled with his power, filled with his riches. Uh, but God sent a young man into his kingdom named Daniel. And Daniel was there. Uh, he was a man of God. He knew the Lord. He, he loved the Lord. He was a man of prayer. And uh, God gave Daniel special gifts. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel 2 had a dream. And this dream tro troubled him so much that he called for all of his, if you see verse 2, his magicians, his astrologers, his sorcerers, and he wanted them to show him what his dream was. He knew he'd had a dream. He knew it was a bad dream. He just couldn't remember the dream. And he said, I want you to tell me what my dream was, and I want you to tell me what my dream means. Well, his magicians and his astrologers said, no king has ever asked anybody this, to tell us what dream you had. We don't know what dream you had. Tell us what dream you had and then tell us what that dream means. We can't do that. And then the king said, well, if, if you can't tell me that, then what good are you to me? I'm going to have all of you killed. That's what he said. That's the kind of power Nebuchadnezzar had. And the word came down to this man of God, Daniel, when uh, the captain of the guard was coming to slay all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel asked Arioch, the, king of the, uh, the captain of the king's guard, he, he said, why is this thing so hasty? Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Verse 15. And I want you to notice verse 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Hananiah Mishael, and Azariah. By the way, that's later on you may have hear, heard of them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, same people. 
his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Lord, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts as I preach your word. Lord, help me to say everything you want said the way you want it said. Lord, please keep our attention for the next few minutes. Lord, I pray that you'll meet every need in this room. You know, some hearts are very troubled. Some are worried and concerned for the future. Others, Lord, are lost and don't know that they're saved. And Lord, I just pray whatever the need is in the room this morning, that you'll meet it through your word as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. So Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. He didn't know what it was. And he didn't know the interpretation of it. And when his wise men couldn't declare to him what his dream was, and certainly couldn't tell him the interpretation, not knowing the dream, he was going to have them killed. But when Daniel heard of that, he went with his friends. And by the way, it's good to have good friends to pray with, godly people to pray with. And he went with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they prayed and they begged God. And then God revealed to them not only Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but He revealed to them the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so I want you to begin with me. Notice verse 20. It says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His, and He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings. Who removes kings? God does. And setteth up kings. Who setteth up kings? God does. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Number one, God is the one who places kings and presidents in positions of authority. I do believe you should vote. I believe you should do whatever you can do, whatever's in your power to accomplish that which you think is the right thing for our country. But I'm going to tell you that at the end of the day, it is God who places kings and presidents in positions of authority, and it is God who removes them. I want you to see Psalm 75, and there's just ample evidence in the Word of God for this. Psalm 75, verse 6, it says, Promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one, and setteth up another. Is there any doubt that God said He is the one who puts down kings and sets up kings? In Exodus chapter 9, verses 12 through 16, God said about Pharaoh, For this purpose have I raised thee up. God put Pharaoh in a position of power. Why? So that all the world would know, not who Pharaoh was, but so all the world would know who God was. In John 19, as Jesus stood before Pilate, he had been arrested. Did he have to allow them to arrest him? No, he he could have destroyed them all. He could, when he just spoke the words, I am, they all fell to the ground. But he allowed them to take him and arrest him. And now Jesus is standing before Pilate. And when he stands before Pilate, uh, Pilate's questioning him and Jesus isn't answering him. And finally, Pilate says, verse 10, uh, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Who gave Pilate that power? God in heaven gave him that power. Who has given our president or a president-elect power? God has given power. And God can take power. God is in charge. Daniel chapter 4, please. Look at Daniel 4. By the way, can I remind all people in places of power, your life is very short and you will stand before God one day. Can I remind you that while you're living in your power and and enjoying it and feeling like you're the king of the world, there's another king. And you'll answer to that king. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17 The Bible in the last half of the verse, this is to Nebuchadnezzar after this dream that we've seen in Daniel 2. Nebuchadnezzar, again, lifted up with his own pride. God is going to bring Nebuchadnezzar through some deep, dark waters for a purpose. What's his purpose? Verse 17, the middle of the verse, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever He will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Look at verse 25, the end of verse 25. It says, till thou know. 
that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever He will. And look at the end of verse 26. After that, these things you're about to go through, Nebuchadnezzar, thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Verse 32, at the end of the verse, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever He will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen in his body. Here's the most powerful man in the world. He's driven from his palace. He's eating grass like an oxen. His body is wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Verse 34, And at the end of the days, those seven long years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High. Yeah, you're high, Nebuchadnezzar, in power, but there's a Most High. There's a King of kings. There's a Lord of lords. And I praised and honored Him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And He doeth according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and His ways judgment and those that walk in pride, He is able to abase. Number one, God is the one who places kings and presidents in their positions of authority and removes them. Number two, God will allow a one world government. Go back to Daniel chapter 2. He has in the past. Uh, Notice Daniel chapter 2. Verses 36 through 38, Daniel now is going to tell the the, the dream. He tells the dream to the king, and uh, notice what he says in verse, uh, uh, verse 31. He tells the dream what he saw. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible, meaning it, it, it would strike terror into you. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand. O, you're powerful, Nebuchadnezzar. And made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. This is that breast and arms of silver. Who is this? It's the Medo-Persian Empire. I'm not going to dig into all the nuts and bolts of these verses, but this is who it is. It's the Medes and the Persians. Read about it in Daniel 5 when they came and conquered the Babylonians. He says, there's coming a kingdom inferior to you, that chest, the arms of silver, that's the Medo-Persian Empire, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. This is none other than Alexander the Great and Greece, who would rule over the earth. Verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. This is none other than Rome. And without getting into all the long history of this, eventually Rome was split into two. Constantine split Rome into two, thus the two legs of iron. But I want you to see verse 40, God has allowed worldwide kingdoms in the past but He will allow it again. 
Notice verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Iron and miry clay don't mix. They don't make a strong bond. Verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom, this worldwide kingdom that is to come, shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now, don't miss verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves. What what does mingle mean? It means mix. They're going to mix themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in these, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So there's coming a kingdom where there's going to be these toes, part of iron, part of clay. They're going to mix, as the Bible says, they're going to mingle, but they won't cleave one to another. Well, what do I think of when I think of that imagery? I think of something like the United Nations. I think of something where you have individual nations that mix and mingle, but they don't cleave one to another. They they haven't broken down the walls of their individual nation, but they're working together. You know, in the UN right now, the council is composed of 15 members. Five are considered permanent members. They're nuclear powers. It's China, France, Russia, the UK, and the United States. And then 10 non-permanent members are elected for two-year terms by the General Assembly. A state which is a member of the United Nations but not of the Security Council may participate without a vote in its discussions when the Council considers that country's interests are affected. Both members and non-members of the United Nations, if they're parties to a dispute being considered by the Council, may be invited to take part without a vote in the Council's discussions. The Council sets the conditions for participation by a non-member state. There is coming a kingdom. It's going to be a worldwide kingdom that's described in verse 43 where it's clay and iron mixed together. They're going to mingle, but they're not going to cleave one to another. Now here's the key. There has to be a man to lead that group. There has to be a man, and there will be. You say, this is scary stuff. No, I want to remind you, God is allowing this. God's allowing this. He told us this is going to happen. I want you to hear the following statement made years ago by Paul Henry Spock, the first president of the United Nations. He said, we do not need another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. You see, God's Word told us there would be a one world government and it will be led by a man. The Bible tells us, it calls him different things, the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the little horn. Uh, You may hear people talk about a new world order. What they're talking about is globalism. They're talking about where, yes, we have our names of our countries and boundaries of our countries, but really we're just one big globalistic empire and the days coming will be ruled and reigned the world will by one, this Antichrist. Go to Daniel chapter 7, verse number 8. Say, this scares me, Pastor. Well, hang on. We're not to the end of the message. Daniel chapter 7. Notice verse 8. Again, there's so many verses here. We we can't get into a full-blown study of this today. Uh, But don't take my word for this. Go back and look at these things in Scripture. Daniel 7, 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. This is the Antichrist. This is who this is talking about before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this eyes, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. Look down in verse 11. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Then look down in verse uh, 21. I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Does God's Word say this horn, this Antichrist, will make war with the saints? He did. Who are the saints? They're God's people, believers from all nations, all nations. 
So this, this is troubling. We're not to the end of the message yet. Verse 24, the ten horns out of this kingdom, this kingdom that will arise, this diverse from all of the kingdoms, are ten kings that shall arise. Notice they all have their own place of authority. And another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall, the saints shall, be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So just as God in the past has allowed a one world government, He will again allow a one world government and it will be led by the Antichrist. And He will make war against the saints and He will prevail against them. For how long? For a time. For a short time. This, is, this reminds me of when Jesus was there. He had been arrested and He's getting ready to go to the cross Say, how in the world would God allow that to happen? I mean, if Jesus is God, couldn't He just call 10,000 angels, destroy the world, and set Him free? If Jesus is God, why in the world would He allow God's people to suffer? If Jesus is God, how come He is standing there before Pilate and not the other way around? Well, because it was all part of God's plan. Jesus said this. He said, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Hey, Satan, it looks like you've won. You've got the Son of God arrested. You're about to crucify the Son of God. It looks like you've won. Oh, no, 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 no. You see, this was all part of God's plan. This is your hour. Go ahead, wickedness. Go ahead, baby murders. This is your hour. Have your fun. Go ahead, sodomites. Have your fun. This is your hour and the power of darkness. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. You you don't like God? You don't like God's Word? You want to kick God out of the public school system? Go ahead. This is your hour and the power of darkness. But your hour is coming to an end. Your hour is coming to an end. Who gave you the power you have? God did. Who sees everything you're doing? God does. Jesus said, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Go to Luke 22. It looked bad. It looked like Satan had won. Jesus Christ, God's Son, about to be crucified. But he didn't understand God's plan, did he? He didn't understand that Jesus Christ had come to be crucified. He had come to give His life. He had come to shed His blood on the cross. Luke 22, verse 53. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Go to chapter 24, verses 6 and 7. Chapter 24, after Jesus has been crucified and shed His blood on the old rugged cross and put in the tomb, and they sealed that tomb so that that deceiver couldn't arise, so so the disciples couldn't steal away His body and say, hey, He rose from the dead. Well, Luke 24, verse 6, that their hour, their power of darkness didn't last very long. In the whole scheme of things, because verse 6, He is not here, but is risen. Remember how He spake unto you when He was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered His words. Look down in verse 25. Then He said unto them, two disciples were walking, and they were... They didn't know yet that Jesus had risen from the dead. They still thought the Savior has been crucified. He's dead. We heard that maybe He's alive, but we don't understand. We don't know what's going on. Verse 25, Jesus is walking with them, and they don't even recognize Him. Then He said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Look at verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written. It was written this way all along. And thus it behooved Christ to suffer. And to rise from the dead the third day. You know why they didn't know Christ came to suffer? Because they didn't understand the Word of God. 
but he came to suffer. Verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Verse 50, And He led them out as far as to Bethany, and He lifted up His hands and blessed them, and it came to pass while He blessed them, He was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped Him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Go to Acts chapter 1, verse 11. As Jesus is ascending up into heaven, these disciples who they have seen Jesus crucified for the sins of all mankind, they've seen Him buried and rise again. Jesus now is ascending before them. He didn't just suddenly disappear. He's ascending and they're watching Him go up. And notice Acts 1.11, as they watch Him go up into heaven, they're standing there just going, just like that. Verse 11, the angels came and said to them, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go into heaven. Number one, God places kings and presidents in positions of authority and He removes them. Number two, God will allow a one world government. He has done it in the past. He will do it again. He will allow the Antichrist to have power over the saints. He will allow him to make war with the saints, to wear out the saints of the Most High. God's Word makes this clear. But number two, this kingdom led by the Antichrist will be destroyed by Jesus Christ. Go to Daniel chapter 6, please. Oh, there is coming a one world government. Uh, but it's not the Antichrist that I'm talking about. It's Jesus Christ, who will rule and reign for how long? Forever. Daniel chapter 6, notice verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar, recognizing who God really is, he said, He is the living God, and steadfast forever in the middle of 26, and His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and His dominion, shall be even unto the end. Go to Daniel 7. When we were reading about the little horn, I didn't read all the verses. Yes, this little horn, his eyes are like the eyes of a man. He has a mouth speaking great things. But verse 9, I beheld till. That means it's temporary. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body did destroyed and given to the burning flame. Look at verse 13. I saw in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought Him near before Him and there was given Him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, every nation, nations and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Verse 18, those saints that have the war, are being warred against what's going to happen with all believers. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom for how long? Forever, even forever and ever. Verse 21, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, but keep reading, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Verse 24, this little horn who in verse 25 speaks great words against the Most High and wears out the saints of the Most High and thinks to change times and laws What's going to happen? Verse 26, the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all his dominions shall serve and obey him. Go back to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel wasn't done telling the meaning of the dream. He said, King, you saw a great image. 
Its head was of gold. Its breast and arms were of silver. Its belly and thighs were of brass. Its legs were of iron. Its feet and its ten toes, part of iron and part of clay. But then, king, you saw something else. You know what you saw, king? Daniel chapter 2. He says, verse 44, In the days of these kings, these kings who will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but shall not cleave one to another, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, well, how does that happen? It's supernatural. It's God. That it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. God places kings and presidents in places of authority. He removes them. God will allow a one world government in the future. He has in the past. We're already moving towards a globalistic economy. We're already moving towards cashless society. We're already moving towards all those things that the Bible has made clear are going to happen. And there will be a man who will make war against the saints, satanically motivated, but he will be destroyed and His kingdom will be destroyed, and the Lord Himself will rule and reign forever. In Psalm chapter 2, the kings of the earth are fretting and they're angry against God because they don't want God controlling them. They want to have their power. They want to have their day. They want to have their will done upon earth. And the Lord just sits in heaven, according to Psalm 2, and He laughs at them. Because He knows their day is coming. Folks, if you're a child of God, oh, there may be suffering between here and eternity, but listen, let me tell you something. His kingdom is coming. His will is going to be done. His kingdom will never be destroyed. We don't have time to look at every other verse through Revelation, many other places, but if you're a child of God, you have nothing to fear. Whoever you voted for, the fact is this, King Jesus, He's still King of kings. He's still Lord of lords. He's still in control. And that hasn't changed our job at all. As a church, our job is to go out and tell a lost, dying world about the Lord Jesus Christ, how to be saved. If you're a child of God, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. You're on the winning side. Let's bow our heads together, please. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I know this was just a quick survey over many of these passages of Scripture. And I'd encourage you to dig down into these more and more. And we do that often on Sunday nights. But what I'm telling you, the very basics here, what we've covered very quickly is this, that ultimately God is the one who sets up authorities. God is the one who removes authorities. God has in the past allowed worldwide empires, and He will again in the future. We see these things materializing before our very eyes. Globalists, the new world order. These aren't conspiracy theories. These are written out plainly in Scripture. And they're right in front of our faces. But number three, ultimately, God Himself will destroy that man-made government, that government ruled by the Antichrist, and God Himself will rule and reign forever. Now, if you're a child of God, you have nothing to fear. John 16, Jesus said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, if you're here today and you're not saved, you do need to be concerned about your soul. You, you need to be concerned about heaven and hell. You need to realize that if you die in your sins lost, you'll face an eternity in hell. But Jesus Christ loves you. He came for that very purpose it looked like Satan had won. He had arrested Jesus. Jesus was being crucified. But that was all part of God's plan. So that Jesus Christ, God's perfect Son, could pay the price for our sins. 
with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're here today and you're not saved, you can trust Him as your Savior today. You can call upon Him and He'll save you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, who would say, Pastor, the truth is I'm not saved. If I were to die today, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me, Pastor. If that's you, would you lift your hand? I need to be saved and I'm not. Would you lift your hand? Our heads are still bowed, our eyes are still closed. Who would say, Pastor, I am saved. I'm not a perfect person, but I have a perfect Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price for my sins. And I've trusted Him. I've believed on Him as my Savior. I know I'm saved. If that's you, would you lift your hand? I know I'm saved. Praise the Lord. Church, you don't have anything to fear. You serve King Jesus, don't you? King of kings, Lord of lords. You are an ambassador for King Jesus. This world's not your home. You're just passing through. Your treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Maybe we need a wake-up call so we're not too comfortable in this world. Maybe we've thought that this was our heaven. No, this is the battlefield. This is the battlefield for lost souls. There are people around you this week. You know what they need? They need a Christian filled with the Spirit of God who will give them the gospel, who will tell them about Jesus Christ. That's what they need. There are people all around you that need to hear the gospel from your lips. Would you yield yourself to King Jesus? Would you be an ambassador for Him? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who would say, Lord, I'll take my responsibility seriously as an ambassador for You? I know Your kingdom is coming. I know Your will is going to be done. Lord, use me in my circle of influence, to be a witness for you. If that's you, would you lift your hand to the Lord? Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we are on the winning side. Not meaning that we're in the process of winning, meaning we've already won. And we know we've won. Lord, thank you for that. And use us to get the gospel to the lost around us this week. In Jesus' name. Let's stand to our...